Well, enough said. I've been applauded. I might just go home. Fantastic. <laughs> no, it's good to be with you. Thank you. Thank you also for tracking. This is Friday morning. You guys have been at this all week. Yeah. So well done. Uh, your brains are filled, swelling, uh, about to overflow. I uh, hope they won't quite explode yet. We want to get through this talk at least before that happens. But you've been taking a lot of information. So uh, along the way, we'll try and operate at a fairly gentle pace. And I'll probably call on you here and there. You can help me think about this issue of apologetics uh, and social media. I want to begin uh, by quoting from a well-known social critic, uh, author, editor, apologist, Oz Guinness. He has uh, written this volume, which is a really wonderful volume. This is one to note uh, in the many resources you've come across this week. This is a superb look at Christian persuasion. Uh, and Oz opens this volume this way. And many of you will have that quote on your outline. He writes, We're all apologists now, and we stand at the dawn of the great age of human apologetics. Or so some are saying, because our wired world and our global era is a time when expressing, presenting, sharing, defending and selling ourselves have become a staple of everyday life for countless millions of people around the world, both for Christians and for others. To put the point more plainly, human inter interconnectedness in the global era has been raised to a truly global level with an unprecedented speed and an unprecedented scale. Everyone is now everywhere, and everyone can communicate with everyone else from anywhere and at any time, instantly and cheaply. Communication through social media in the age of email, text, messages, cell phones, tweets, and Skype is no longer from the few to the many, as in the age of the book, the newspaper, and television, but from the many to the many all the time. One of the effects of this globalization is plain. Active and interactive communication is the order of the day. From the shortest texts and tweets, to the humblest website, to the angriest blog, to the most visited social networks, the daily communications of the wired world attest that everyone, is now in the business of relentless self-promotion. Presenting themselves, explaining themselves, defending themselves, selling themselves, or sharing their inner thoughts and emotions as never before in human history. That is why it can be said that we are in the grand age of apologetics. The whole world has taken up apologetics without even using or knowing the idea as we Christians understand it. We are all apologists now, if only on behalf of the daily me or the updated tweet that we post for our virtual friends and our cyber community. Os Guinness goes on to note that as followers of Jesus, as advocates of Christian faith, we, it is in our genes to speak up and to share. And so he asked the question, what does this grand age of apologetics mean for the followers of Jesus? And to that question comes this answer. On the one hand, our age is quite simply the greatest opportunity for Christian witness since the time of Jesus and the apostles. And our response ought to be to seize with boldness and with imagination this enterprise of communicating. If ever the wide and effective door that St. Paul prayed for has been opened, it's now. But on the other hand, we have to face up to the many challenges of this new age of communication with realism. There are oddities to this age of communication that actually make it harder to communicate well today than at any time perhaps before. 
So the opportunity is real, but it's a rather mixed bag and we need to contend with both sides of that equation. Now in his volume, Oz will go on to talk at length about the lost art of Christian persuasion and the desperate need for its recovery in our moment of time. He will go on to offer various strategies of persuasion. We, however, will turn our attention to considering the prevalence of social media and how we might engage apologetically online. This morning, our task, and I say it's our task because I'll be calling on you at various points to help me, is to consider our use of social media in relation to our desire to speak up for our faith and to advocate for Jesus in whom is hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So where are we headed? We're going to start by taking a couple of steps back to ask some basic overarching questions touching social media. After that, we'll step in a little closer with a view to weighing the pros and the cons of utilising social media for apologetic ends or purposes. And then we'll kind of step right in, as it were, and suggest some principles and some strategies uh, for how we might engage apologetically online. At that point, I'll conclude by inviting you to share your own thoughts, stories, experiences, to pull out your own questions, perhaps to take out your own phone or your laptop to see if we can't answer some questions that maybe your friends actually have. You might be midway in a dialogue that we can shed some light on. We'll see how we go for time. But that's where we're headed. All right. So first we want to step back to consider social media kind of in overview. Uh, And here I want to ask two questions. Uh, What do we mean by social media? And then why is it that so many Americans utilize social media? Now, I recognize that uh, in one sense to ask the question, what do we mean by social media, is to risk eye rolls and gasps of, well, duh, (laughs) right? Um, 81% of the entire US population has a social networking profile. The vast majority of Americans are active online, network, connected, utilizing these platforms. And then Facebook alone now has 2 billion global users. That's just one particular platform. In addition, The phrase social media is so much a part and parcel of our language, it's thrown around so frequently that we may find it hard to imagine the question to be worthwhile. What is social media? What are you talking about? I know intuitively what it is. I do it, I use it all the time. However, given that social media is describing so much that we post on websites and apps as diverse, for example, as Facebook, Google+, Twitter, Reddit, LinkedIn, YouTube, Vine, SoundCloud, Pinterest, Instagram, Flickr, Shots, Snapchat, Tumblr, Medium, Swarm, Foursquare, Yik Yak, Tinder, uh, Kik, Periscope, Blab, WhatsApp, the the list goes on, right? Uh, Some of these are built platforms for team sharing, Other of these are for posting photographs, hobbies and crafts. Some are for commerce purposes, others are for music. You know how it all works, right? There's an incredible diversity hiding, lurking underneath this label, social media. And what this means, actually, when you read the literature, is that even experts don't agree what's to be included or excluded in the definition of social media. So we are gonna pause momentarily in order to clarify what we're talking about, at least as it touches this talk this morning. Simply stated, the social aspect of social media refers to interacting with other people by way of sharing information with them 
and receiving information from them, whether text, image, audio, or some combination. The media aspect refers to the instrument of communication, like the internet or mobile phone, whereas TV, radio, and newspapers are more examples of traditional media. The, these are not items typically included uh, in this list. If we pull the two aspects of interaction and instrument together, we can define social media as web-based communication tools that enable people to interact with each other by sharing and consuming information. Here's our baseline definition. Now, as we let that definition sit for a minute, what I want us to note is this, that to the degree that our interest or our focus this morning pertains to Christian apologetics, then enabling people to interact with each other by sharing and consuming information places social media and our practice of social networking firmly within the purview of Christian apologetics, of commending and defending the faith. It was interesting, I've spoken to different people in preparing for this talk, and many uh, folk found it quite difficult to imagine what social media has to do with Christian apologetics. For some folks, Christian apologetics is a very defined field of topics and inquiry. We talked a little bit about that on Monday, right? But here we see, by the very way we define social media, we see that actually we are in overlapping circles, overlapping domains here. It's really important that when we think of apologetics and we prepare ourselves to defend the faith, that we also think about and include this element of social networking and so on. All right, the second question, a little bit more fun, I trust. Why is it or why do so many Americans use social media? Now, this was a, an interesting question that Pew Research Center actually spent a good deal of money to discover. So according to Pew, two-thirds of online adults use various social media platforms. Reasons for this are fairly predictable, although I suspect that the generation represented here in this room, that's you, will have additional and perhaps rather different reasons than the following. So I'm going to begin give you the Pew research and then I'm going to kind of call on you. According to Pew, 91% of adults say that staying in touch with current friends is their most significant reason for using social media. 87% of adults point to staying in touch with family members as an important motivation for social networking. 86% of adults note they're connecting with older friends that they've lost touch with. This is a way of recovering connection. 43% of adults report using social media to make new friends. 25% of adults surveyed report they use social media to engage the comments or the opinions of notable public persons, whether celebrities, politicians, sport figures, and so on. 16% report finding uh, potential romantic or dating partners. Okay, So we're, getting, we're beginning to see some of the reasons that people have for engaging social media. But let me ask you, as you think about your use, right? why do so many of you use social media? What, what are some of your motivations or reasons? Go ahead. To gain new information. To gain new information. Keep up with the latest trends. Keep up with the latest trends, all right. Go ahead. Know what, your friends are doing. know what your friends are doing, okay. And to find where they are, right, if it's a location app, yeah? Okay, for, for educational purposes, go ahead. I think like to express myself and then also to keep up with people like 
Good to express yourself. That's a very uh, p- a pervasive reason. Yep, go ahead. Okay, there's underlying reasons, yep, as well. Go ahead. For scavenger hunt competitions. Okay. Okay, scavenger hunt competitions, geocaching, yeah. All right. Go ahead. For memes. For memes, all right. Very good, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. To show off what you're doing, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Anyone else want to add something we haven't heard? Jeremy? Throw out ideas? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good, good. Go ahead. To find love, okay. To broadcast, okay. Now let me just stop here for a moment. Let me ask this question. Okay. What has, what has no one said just yet? Clue. Think about our topic. What has no one said just yet? Go ahead, green shirt. Share the gospel. All right, good. So here's the, here's the point, right? We would have got there eventually, but we need to note that while our focus is Christian apologetics, right, and our topic is thinking about Christian apologetics in relation to social media, we need to take seriously the fact that few of us let alone our friends, think apologetically when we are active online. Okay? There are some groups and individuals that are very deliberate. They've laid hold of the media in order to broadcast Christian faith, to talk about Christian things. But generally speaking, I think we do apologetics accidentally online right we find ourselves in a conversation we're tweeting back and forwards or we're texting or we're messaging or video chatting or whatever it is and then all of a sudden somebody says something or makes a striking claim or pushes back a little too hard and boom we all kind of burst into flame in terms of our temperament our attitude our expectations right on the one hand i want to hold out that social media is a legitimate domain for apologetic engagement and it's being used that way all the time. But I also, on the other hand, want us to understand that very few of us have been deliberate or thoughtful or careful about doing apologetics online. We've not yet made the transitions uh, in our mind and in our practice to understand, oh, this is a different medium. It may demand adjustments in our expectations and our practices, okay? All right, let me move to a second point in the talk here. We want to step in a little closer now, think more about apologetics. Uh, Here, we want to weigh some of the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, We're going to start off general and then move specific. One of the most interesting realities of the social media revolution that we are in relates to the very obvious love-hate relationship that we have with being connected online. For every person who is excited by the obvious and the profound opportunities that exist online, just as many others express reservation and wariness as to the inescapable negatives. Like everything in life, there are pros and cons to social media. So if we think generally for a moment, that is if we think big picture about our online lives, uh, let me hear from you some of the pros and cons about social media. We're not yet running to apologetic discourse, but just in general. What are some of the good things and some of the negative things you're aware of? Um, a con would be that it can further reinforce this idea of like I guess needing attention. Okay. And it can sort of make the affirmation of likes and follows as a kind of like 
Good, good. I really like the way you said that. I hope we heard that. What you didn't say was, it causes. We hear that a lot all the time. I actually don't think the internet causes, but it does reinforce, it does play to uh, attention seeking, needs for affirmation. It becomes one more platform. I'm going to ask over this side of the room. I saw a hand. I just, there is. Go ahead and I'll come back to you. Okay, there's a pro, go ahead. They can talk to people a lot faster. Okay, faster, further away, go ahead. It can probably be like cyberbullying. Cyberbullying, yep, yep, go ahead. <laughs> it can be stressful. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Well, there are numerous published uh, reports about uh, what our, our online activity is doing to us psychologically, mentally, emotionally. Go ahead, brown shirt. Okay. Since you are kind of okay. Things good, good. If you would say things to someone that you wouldn't normally say in person. Face to face, right? Yeah. Go ahead. I think it's easy to um, see and reinforce the idea that everyone else's life is perfect, and so you see their mask and okay. you see it as like. Yeah, good, good. There is a different persona often. Go ahead. Uh, one major con, well, I kind of have a pro con deal. A uh, pro because it's really convenient to stay connected with people that you used to know. Good. But a con could be uh, oh, uh, we s spend most of our life basically on this on okay. these websites that we normally use for yeah. social media when we can be doing something. That's right. Else. We can cultivate a virtual persona and not be quite as equally committed to cultivating our actual persona. Go ahead. Yeah. talk to them and yeah. then it's kind of a situation where uh, your audience is largely in these yeah. situations. Okay, good. Go ahead. Um, like you feel less likely to, like you'd be less likely to get in contact with the person like in person because okay. you're going to be like, like texting each other and calling okay. each other Skype. It can substitute for real activity. Yep, go ahead. Safety concerns, good, good. I think we're getting the picture, right? So, good. There are, there are some very definite pros here. There are very good things uh, about social media and, and networking. But there are some things that we ought to take seriously and, and be concerned about and be watchful over. Let me shift the lens just a moment now. While it's not true, uh, sorry, while, while it is true, that each of the responses, pro and con, we've noted so far may have some impact or relevance in terms of apologetics. Let me ask you now to think more specifically about engaging people online or via social networking. Uh, very few users take up social media with the intent of engaging in apologetics uh, discourse so what are the pros and the cons when it comes to sharing our faith online? So we've got the big picture. Now we're going to dive a little deeper. Yes. Um, I found that online people take Christianity as more of a joke. Okay. Okay. Can we become very lighthearted very quickly? Um, social media is a lot more impersonal than I think it was mentioned before. The okay. Okay. Very good. Could be impersonal. Go ahead. Can come across as like really shallow. You know, okay. some people they take like some generic Shutterstock photo and yep. throw Bible verse yep. on yep. it. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Good. Back over here. Yep. It's often more defensive and out there because you're not face to face and okay. you don't think you need to be um, apathetic. Okay. Go ahead. Um, you have time to think about your words. Good. I like the pro. Yeah, good. We're, we're getting short change on the pros here. That's awesome. Go ahead. Um, people don't really know who you are. They okay. don't know anything about you, so they don't really understand where you're coming from. Okay, it's quite possible. Yes, I'm going to go over here and then here. Go ahead. Well, no one really wants to be equated with, like, the crazy trolls or okay. 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 Get lumped into groups. Go ahead. Good, yeah. Like yeah. Gets disconnected from context. Yep, go ahead. Oh, yeah, yep. Um, no one can, oh, you can spread your faith a lot faster. Okay, 
Oh, good, good. Stan, you're going to add something? Some more pros? Yeah, we'll get some more pros. Well, but I, I find out that I have a chance to give a more, a more well thought through response. Okay. So you, you, can, you, you have control of time. When you're interacting directly, time is, is immediate. Good, when you, yep. When you encapsulate it in, on social media, you can compress time or, or expand time and focus on what you want to do so you can get your message right. Good, good. Go ahead. Reach more people. Good. I, last one. Very good. Social media is becoming its own culture. Yeah. With like, um, it's it's becoming its own language almost. That's right. That tone is becoming more and more. That's right. Now we have emojis to supply tone, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, the sort of the culture of media affirmation okay. on social media, you can't you run the risk of being more worried about you know that was a really stupid argument uh -huh. that I should have than necessarily sharing. The yeah. Good, good. All right. So again, lots of pros, lots of cons. Let me just let me give you some of my pros and cons. They're not altogether different, but I think they'll fill out some of this commentary a little bit. On the pro on the positive side, I've got three. You'll see them on your outline: privacy, trust, and availability. Here's what I mean. Now, touching on privacy, uh, not only are a great many people utilizing social media now accessible or approachable in ways that previously would not have been uh, possible, but I actually find a lot of people to be remarkably open. It strikes me that many people, not all, but many people find it easier, more comfortable to ask questions about faith in a private space online. Perhaps this is the equivalent of Nicodemus visiting Jesus at night. Right? This idea of, well, I don't want to just kind of out myself and talk about my religious interests or my religious confusion or my personal struggles, but there are forums and venues and discussion groups and individuals who are accessible to me. That I, in the privacy of my home, with the safety of su sufficient space, can actually open my heart and share my thoughts. Trust. Well, distrust born of hyperactive communication styles and questionable or plastic self-presentations can be a real factor online, yet I have often found that online engagement over time can develop into real trust. Sometimes this is rooted in a prior relationship, but other times trust develops through the online connection alone. Not, of course, by pouncing on people or raising apologetic issues out of the blue, but where a questioner feels they're connecting with you and that their question or differing point of view will be welcomed, taken seriously, treated with respect, then sharing's one, sharing one's faith online can build trust, allowing for quite deep, and very meaningful exchange. Uh, it's been striking to me. I have a friend, some people in this room will know him. His name is Jacob Toman. I think he, was, he spoke in the week. Is that right? From Good Guy Gaming? Maybe not? No, uh, he did not. Okay. I'm hoping that he'll be able All to get right. him involved in the future. Good. Jacob Toman is based here in St. Louis. Uh, Jacob has an interest in online gaming. And over a period of time, he's developed a ministry in which he's available to chat with, connect to gamers around the world. All over the world, he's in conversations with men and women that he's not actually met, but who are seeking him out after playing games to ask him deeper, more personal questions. He's been asked now by some of these folk to travel, to visit with them, to do funerals, to counsel bad relationships. In other words, this has been a development of the online presence. Trust has been built, creating opportunities. It is possible. Third, availability. This is related, obviously. Thinking more about people engaging me than me engaging them. Another pro, at least in my experience, relates to how many times I have been searched out or messaged by others to answer their questions or explain some element of Christian faith. 
simply being available on social media has increased opportunities in ways that I would never have anticipated. Thoughtfully, I hope, uh, but publicly for sure, sharing content about my Christian faith and how I try to make sense of all of life through the lens of my Christian faith has facilitated lots of connections and conversations. It's not become not uncommon in our house for the uh, cell phone to buzz or uh, other platforms to signal uh, and here are people who say, hey, I heard from a friend that you answered this question. I saw this post. I think I can trust you. You might be able to be helpful. What do you think about X, Y, or Z? Um, so there are real pros if we're attentive to it. There are real opportunities before us. On the negative side, let me give you three cons that I actually endeavor to keep before me when I think about apologetic engagement online. These three cons are each potential disruptors of communication. So I look for them. I try to work against them. We're talking here about narrow casting, multitasking, and contextlessness. I'm not sure that's a word. I may have to find a better one, but we'll go with it for now, okay? Uh, narrow casting is the tendency to constrict our identities so that we become often unwittingly prejudiced and insular. This leads us to exaggerate shared traits amongst those we perceive to be like us, while also shielding ourselves from exposure to alternate viewpoints, those who are not like us. Whether we speak of echo chambers, filter bubbles, or informational silos, the phenomenon of narrow casting is something that all online apologists need to be aware of. In particular, we need to recognize the ways in which this counteracts exposure to apologetic content. I hope you realize, not all do, that posting does not equal gaining attention, nor does it guarantee consumption. Right? And the way in which it impacts the quality of information exchange when we're, in a, uh, when we're narrow casting, when we're in an informational silo, there's often a marked absence of critical rationality. There can be a high presence of emotion, but there's often low critical analysis. The idea is that we're already perceived to be outside the tribe. You see a buzzword, you see a key term, you recognize this person as a Christian or whatever, and they're instantly discounted. We are outside the identity of the group and the values they're cultivating. We need to be aware of that. That's a very real phenomena. What about multitasking? Multitasking is something that we're probably not used to thinking about in terms of apologetics. But when engaging with people via social media, I tend to expect that the recipient or recipients at the other end are doing more than simply attending to my words. In terms of how I engage in apologetics, this leads me to expect brevity and immediacy over substance and death. It also leads me to, con to believe that their conclusions will be drawn on rather little information. And the gap between what is said and what is finally done to often be unusually high. As many now fear, in social networking environments, substantive contributions, carefully crafted content can easily become like litter on a virtual highway of triviality and amusement. All to say, the idea of undivided attention is not a presupposition that I work with. Now, that's not a value statement necessarily. I'm not intending to put someone down or to cast uh, aspersions, but you just think about the way that you function 
If you're on your laptop, you've probably got multiple screens going and you're in multiple domains. If you've got your cell phone, you're in between several conversations and you're listening to music as well, right? This is just the reality of the media. Its convenience is one of its chief joys. It's also one of the chief inhibitors of quality communication. So when you're doing apologetics online, really it would be unusual that you have complete and undivided attention. Other things are going on. You're with your friends at the cafe. You, you know, you're, in the, in the, you're holding your phone under the, in the movie theater under the seat because it's not meant to be on, right? Uh, you're doing all kinds of things at once. All right, contextlessness. If you can come up with a better word, I'll take it. This is a mouthful, but for now, while glad to be connecting, the truth is that I sometimes know relatively little about whom I'm connecting to. On the one hand, this picks up on the issue of plasticity and how a person may choose to present themselves in a, a varied number of ways online. True motivations for engaging me or for engaging the topic under discussion are quite hidden, as are the person's situation and the range of personal identifiers typically available through face-to-face -face communication. Now, video is some help, but it's still a far cry from being present one-on-one. -on -one. You know, 93% of our communication is nonverbal, right? You think what happens when you take that information pool away or when it's significantly diminished. On the other hand, and uppermost in my mind, is the well-known tendency towards disinhibition. Disinhibition is the label that scholars of social media give to people who are unrestrained by normal social conventions while online. Uh, this results in unfiltered communication. Whereas most of us have some appreciation that when we're talking about politics or sexuality or religion, some sense of decorum and some sensitivity to context is wise, even necessary. And whereas relatively few of us have experienced being shouted down, openly ridiculed or summarily dismissed while talking to a friend over coffee or talking together on the sofa, this has become the experience of a great many online. If you believe this silliness, I don't ever want to talk to you again. If you associate with this group and this idea, well, I just hope you get hit by a truck and die. Typically, this kind of thing is typed in all caps, accompanied by profanity and lots of exclamation points, right? <laughs> this, is the, this is the quagmire of communications uh, on social media, where we are shielded from the impact of our tone and our mode of speaking. Sadly, too many Christians also fall into this trap, the trap of treating people differently online than in real life. This makes this a most serious con when it comes to engaging in apologetics online. Now, we could multiply the positives and the negatives, right? But I think we have a good, a good handle on the idea that we have to be wise, we're going to have to be discerning, we're going to have to be self-controlled, therefore deliberate if we're going to engage through this media. What I want to do now is, is kind of keep stepping in towards the issue and suggest some principles uh, and, a, and a strategy. Now this is broad picture because it's going to have to be adapted and tweaked to particular media and to particular levels of friendship and, uh, and, and intimacy, right? But we want to start here to thinking about how do we minimize harmful practices and missteps? How do we maximize helpful principles? And what kind of broad strategy might actually enable us to fulfill the biblical mandate to always be ready to give an answer 
for the hope that is within you with gentleness and respect. We're under that banner even when we're online, right? Now, on this occasion, and because others have offered various assorted principles, I'm going to simply draw attention to these. So on your outline, I'm not going to go through them, but on your outline is a number of uh, websites or uh, where you can go and hear from various people who suggest ways, uh, principles for engaging online. Uh, some of them are good, uh, some of them are better, some of them I'll say no more about, but I think all of them are, are worth considering. What I want to do though is move straight into a broad strategy that I'm hoping will be useful to you in a variety of settings. Okay? And as you hear me talk and as you take notes, uh, if there are questions that come to mind, jot them down on the side of your page so that we can come back and do this. We'll try and make sure there's good time uh, for discussion. All right, begin this way uh, with four baseline commitments, right? Assuming that we're realistic about what social uh, media platforms may allow, assuming that we're committed to engaging Christianly or what we might describe as engaging ethically while online, let me highlight four baseline values that I think ought shape our wading in to the discourse. First, I think we do well to let each person or audience speak for themselves. That is, don't use your belief set or your position to interpret their stance or their assertion. Don't assume you know what they believe and why they believe it. Too much interaction makes the fatal mistake of assuming we know more about what they believe than they do. Eh, thank you for playing. Please leave the stage. That's really poor form. It's arrogant and it leads to all kinds of errors and confusions. Communication is far more likely to be aided by our being willing to learn from others via questions or requests for more information or for help from their preferred resources than by our assumptions. Okay? People have the right to speak for themselves. Take time. You know, tweet back a question. This seems interesting to me, or I don't think I fully understand. Can you recommend a good resource? Can you say more about this? Simple as that. Second, wherever possible, talk with and about individuals rather than generic positions or ideologies. Many factors influence what a person believes. And most faiths and most philosophical positions are capable of being held with some degree of diversity. Just because somebody says they're a Muslim does not mean that they're a radical or a liberal. They might be new to the faith. They may, may be nominal. In other words, don't just assign them to the group. Once again, work to understand what they believe minus the label. Okay? The label alone very rarely helps you grasp what your friend or this person online is thinking. Third, respect the adherence of other faith or of competing understandings. Now, I'll be clear, respect does not mean acceptance, doesn't necessarily mean agreement, but it does entail being accurate, seeking to actually understand and sincerely held beliefs and practices of others and not resorting to caricature or deliberate distortions. Thou shalt not bear false witness. That means you don't get to distort the unbeliever's point of view just because that might make it easier to tear down or push back. Okay? We are constrained by the truth. Also, part of respecting the other is to allow them to proselytize or to seek to persuade you. Right? How can we be online 
engaging in apologetics and suddenly be so upset or be offended that they actually want to promote their point of view as well. Right? This is the cost of admission. This is the price of play. There is going to be a very real give and take. So listen carefully. Expect to be given a compelling or a persuasive viewpoint even as you seek to do the same. Fourth, grant each person the freedom to make his or her own decisions. That is, resist coercion. Every religion, every philosophy, every position has its jealousies. Everyone makes a strong claim somewhere. But we are to resist compulsion as much as we are falling silent. And when we think of coercion or compulsion, I'm not just thinking physically, because we're online, right? But when you threaten to defriend, right? When you uh, make threats about their position, if you believe this, if you do this, X will happen and everyone will laugh or ridicule. You know, when you remove yourself in certain ways and predict great harm, these are coercive aspects that you ought do well to avoid. There are entailments to beliefs, but we need to ask ourselves, am I making an argument or am I actually strong-arming someone? Am I being coercive? As a Christian apologist, we have no business there. And it doesn't work online just as it doesn't work in real life. All right. So there's some baseline commitments that shape our general demeanor and approach. But I want to get into now some ethical online engagement. And that's shaped by three practical realities. Okay. And I'll do this reasonably quick. First, uh, we often say, it was funny that we talked about Labrie at the top. This is a, a Schaeferism. Many in Labrie talk this way. Uh, the first practical reality is that we are all glorious ruins. Okay, that's an image. Don't know how many of you have ever traveled to Europe uh, or the UK. If you've ever done a castle tour, some of you are nodding. Good. We well, have seen those lovely pictures of medieval castles on the horizon in a book or in a movie. Um, but as you draw, you know, on the horizon, they look fantastic. These are significant pieces of architecture that have stood the test of time, that are grand in scale, eminently intricate and beautiful, glorious. And yet as you take the tour, you realize, hang on a minute, no one's home. No one lives here. This thing's falling apart. It's drafty and it's cold. It's a ruin, right? Here's the point of the image. Each of us and everybody that you engage is a glorious ruin. Everybody was made in God's image. We were given all kinds of capacities and abilities. We are glorious creatures, such, says C.S. Lewis, that if we recognize persons for who they are, we would be tempted to fall down and worship them. Okay. Glorious, because of creation in the image of God, and yet ruined because of the fall. There are vestiges of original beauty, but there are sharp edges, right? And there are rebellious hearts and foolish choices and decisions so that we function as damaged goods, even as we continue somehow to give glimpses and to signal that we were made for so much more. Every person you engage online is a glorious ruin. They're a mixed bag. Second, we all struggle to separate our feelings from our faith commitments. Up until recently, far too many apologetic texts not only failed to address online environments, but also the more basic reality of our emotional lives. Uh, if, if you visit me in my office, uh, there's several rows of books, many of which are apologetics textbooks. You, you'll search in vain for a chapter, let alone a book, that takes seriously our emotional capacities. None of us are brains on a stick. All of us are embodied, and therefore we come complete with a wide range of emotions. We ought to take seriously this wide range of emotion 
as we, get, as we engage people online. Feelings cannot easily be pacified once triggered. Neither can they simply be put to one side. Any negotiation, apologetic dialogue or debate will proceed with our feelings present and actively engaged. So as you're tweeting, typing, texting, Instagramming, fill in the blank there with your friends, and you notice that things are taking a turn, their blood pressure's up, they're a little angry, their questions are coming back a little sharper, you may need to ask yourself, what can I do to de-escalate this? I may actually to disengage here. I might need to send them a smiley face just to say, hey, boy, that was, that was tough, but hey, I'm with you. I didn't mean that, I mean this. We're also all operating with some golden rule-like expectation, right? Generally speaking, it's rare to find someone absolutely devoid of any character or sensitivity. Do unto others as you'd have them do to you remains a feature of most discourse. Even where we do find it selectively applied or surprisingly absent, as Christians, we have no option but to treat our conversational partners warmly and winsomely. For us, treating them as we expect to be treated is not merely tactical. It's an essence. It's an essential element, ingredient of Christian communication. That one little rule has been so profoundly violated by way too many Christian apologists, particularly in the online environment. Somehow we feel like we can just throw caution to the wind. Say it plain, say it sharp, let the chips fall where they may. I beg to differ. That is not going to help us reach and persuade. All right, so there's some bigger picture things. I just want to think now uh, about an actual model, if you will, a basic model of Christian apologetic engagement touching social media. Three phrases, you can see them there, they're on your outline. Uh, exploring, explaining, entering. Sometimes we use the language of affirming, building a bridge and clarifying. Uh, you can choose whatever is most appealing. But here, here we're going to unpack now the concerns of each phase, right? We can't do this with any great detail because we do want to get to discussion. But let me give you enough that you can track with me and that you can at least evaluate this uh, methodology. So phase one, exploring the other person's viewpoint. Here, the goal is to ensure that we accurately understand the other person's position or viewpoint and to communicate what we can affirm. Uh, it's very rare that somebody's 100% wrong, by the way. Often it's a, this mixture of truth and untruth. So where can we affirm? Where can we uh, nod and say, yes, this actually is not what's under dispute at all. It's more over here that I'm looking. The basic steps to achieve this include asking for the other person's help in understanding him or her. I got a text the other day, just out of the blue, it was like a single sentence, um, just said, um, I know you're a Christian, but I'm against Christianity. It's just it's done so much harm. That's it. Now what could I do? You know? And so I, my, my response was, I think I hear you. Are you referring to any particular harm? Have I, heaven forbid, harmed you? That were my two questions. It resulted in a phone call. Hey, I'm sorry that came off sharp. I, I, I was watching this documentary and my juices were up. And, you know, <laughs> it happens, right? Ask for them to help you understand what's going on. Uh, graciously draw out the other person's thoughts, feelings, motivations, desires. Not just what they've said, but why they've said it. And to what degree of commitment do they have to what they've said. I had another uh, friend recently uh, who, who made a kind of a comment, a brief 
remark on Messenger that just said, uh, dude, you're an idiot. <laughs> uh, not the first time that's happened, by the way. Maybe not the last. Uh, but I'm like, well, I, there's no context, you know. Um, and so I wrote back and, and asked him, hey, um, you just call, call me an idiot. Um, is there something particular going on I should be aware of? Um, uh, what kind of idiot am I? Uh, am I an idiot because you've associated me with something that's happened to you in the last 24 hours? Or am I just that general kind of idiot that happens to be on the wrong side of the issue at hand? So what I'm asking for is more information. I'm not rebutting him. I'm not resisting him. I'm not letting my juices go well up and say, well, I'm not an idiot, but you're the idiot. I mean, that's, uh, what's going on? Uh, summarize what you hear. When, what information are you receiving and how is it connected? Uh, summarize the other person's point of view and invite their corrections so as to make sure you understand them. Boy, that's an important point. You know, brother, sister, I, I, I think you're saying this. You appear to lump me and all Christians in this category here, but I just want to make sure before I respond, and I've got a response, but before I respond, is this really where you're going. No, 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 that's not what I meant at all. Or yes, that's where I'm going. You're telling that you're hearing them and you're asking more. Only then speak your point of view where it aids keeping the conversation going. Now, I've built these things out as points or steps. There's no order here. This is wisdom, not legislation, right? So as you go in the to and fro, as you're messaging, texting, uh, whatever, uh, just be aware that you're actually exploring their point of view, not just digging in on your own and getting defensive. Phase two, then, is where we begin to shift, explaining your viewpoint persuasively. Now, the goal is to encourage the person to consider your point of view. You've been courteous, you've been kind, you've been patient, you really do have a good grasp on what's going on for them. Now we're asking for the favour to be returned. The goal now is to encourage them to hear you, to weigh your words, and we do this by way of bridge building, connecting the audience and their issue to the concerns and the answers within our Christian framework. Here are some basic steps that will help us secure a fair hearing. Ask for a fair hearing. Well, there's a surprise. Hey, my friend, um, we've just spent 10 minutes back and forwards on instant messenger here. Uh, I, 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 I'd love, can, I, can, I, can I, we just hold off the talk bubbles for a moment? Can I just let me get this thought out and see what you think? Offer some explanation of how what you heard from them affects you. Maybe now that you understand their viewpoint, you're reevaluating a response. Perhaps you can see a new point of identification, something shared. Perhaps it left you surprised, even alarmed. Because you're on a platform uh, that may is not face to face, supply some of what you're feeling. Carefully explain your own values, thoughts, ideas, desires, being attentive to two things, plausibility structures and sacred cause. What am I talking about? A plausibility structure is that which governs what a person is willing to consider as true, valuable or attractive. Some people can go this far and no further, right? So there's no point aiming all the way out here. What are they able to hear? What are they able to receive? What's governing this issue for them? Sacred cause have to do with uh, cherished beliefs. Uh, these limit what's tolerable, permissible, non-negotiable. So for some people in our day, equality is a cherished belief. If it doesn't sound equal, if it doesn't sound just or fair, forget about it. Okay. So you've got to look for those tripwires. Also, 
without being robotic or insensitive, ask for restatements of what you've just said. Ask or invite reviews of your position, gently addressing any factual accuracies. In other words, we're trying hard to limit misunderstanding, which so easily creeps in when we're multitasking uh, and when we're doing uh, different things at different times, having different conversations with different groups. So exploring, explaining, and then entering deeper into the dialogue. Recognizing that apologetic takes time and that achieving clarity and securing agreement is not quick. So the goal of this third phase is to move towards resolution by way of clarifying and challenging as time and need allows. That's a critical phrase, right? Owing to the limitations of social media, many of which we've discussed, let me suggest that there's one way to facilitate the deeper dialogue is actually by shifting the conversation offline towards face-to-face -to -face encounters. That's not always possible, granted, but often it is. Many of the people that we're engaging via social media actually do not live in Timbuktu, right? They may just be the zip code down the road. Perhaps they're in the floor above us at the shopping mall, right? So where we can shift the conversation offline, where you sense interest and where curiosity is peaked and engagement is now possible, we say, hey, this is too important to do this here. Can we grab coffee or can we do this? Where that's not possible, then I think we're going to have to proceed uh, gently and carefully. Whether face-to-face -face or remaining online, basic steps in this third juncture include continuing to mutually affirm where that's possible and continuing to bridge build where that seems most effective. Can I just say, uh, as Christians, generally speaking, uh, we're perceived this way. I, I think there's good evidence for the perception. The perception might be reality. But generally speaking, Christians, we are the party of no. Right? No, I disagree. No, I don't think that's right, good, true, kind, or otherwise. No, no. We're always telling people no. Right? We need to understand that while there are some things we must say no to, there is much that we can affirm and build out on and lead people up from. So let's be careful that in our conversations we're affirming where we can with integrity, with sincerity. Also, we're going to have to check or pace the conversation so as to ensure there is mutual interest in going further. I do this in all conversations anyway, you know, but especially on social media. Hey, we've gone back and forth for 10, 15 minutes. Awesome for me. How are you doing? Didn't you say you had an appointment to get to? Hey, we've gone back and forth here for the last uh, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, this is cool for me. Uh, are you okay to, if we keep going on this? Can I press a little more? Those simple invitations let you know where folks are at and lets you know that they're mutually invested in the conversation. If they're not, don't force the conversation. That doesn't go well, ever. Leverage shared insights that allow the discourse to develop without becoming stale or bogged down. Where no mutual interest, shared insight, or basic goodwill exists, apologetics becomes a showstopper, right? Persuasion runs on the back of people's interest. If they're not interested, and more than that, if they've done, their interest has expired, it's really, really hard for persuasion to continue. It feels more like coercion at that point. I don't want to be here, but he hasn't stopped talking. I don't want to be in this conversation, but she's still texting me furiously. Without disregarding the interest of your conversation partner, clarify, seek to address more important, more ultimate matters. Sometimes in a conversation, you know you need to land the plane, right? I think sometimes we need to say, hey, listen, I could talk about our favorite film all day, 
or this interpretation of this theory all week. But you know what, what I want to come back to is this. Is it okay if we press here for a moment? Most people actually respond well to that. And if they don't, they often tell you, no, because I'm not ready or it hurts or you actually gain a lot of good information that way. But it's courteous and it's wise to check in. And of course, as you deem it appropriate, and as it seems fitting, challenge the heart, the mind, the imagination. Be aware that you may have to yield to a person's own readiness or lack thereof, but at some point there really is room to challenge, especially when all along the way you've been checking in to see that their interest continues, when you really have made an effort to understand their position and they yours. Now a challenge might be a call to change one's mind. It might be an agreement to engage a new resource or to pick up the conversation again next time. We need to hear that repent is not the only word of challenge. Okay? It is a challenge, it is an important one, but it is not the only way that we challenge our friends. All right, a couple of things and then we'll turn it to you. Other things to keep in mind. Our proximate goal is to serve our friends by offering a fitting response giving, uh, given the constraints of the media. Our ultimate goal is to serve the Saviour by giving an answer to the hope that is within us with gentleness and respect. It's helpful, I think, to keep the proximate and the ultimate goal in mind. Also need to keep in mind that there will be impediments. As with most literal public squares, so the metaphorical public square of social media will see us speaking to multiple audiences simultaneously and thus to being jostled and jeered a little. Our efforts at communication will be cut short by endless distractions offered online and frustrated by a lack of civility and charity. Folks, this is part of the territory at the moment. We ought not be surprised by this. We don't want to contribute to it. We want to set a higher level of engagement, a more winsome way of speaking and sharing. But let us not be surprised that engaging people online will likely be difficult when it comes to sharing things of substance and ultimacy. The particular challenges of engaging apologetics online can be daunting even faith shaking. Indeed, a few months ago when I asked the question, is social media a good venue or vehicle for Christian apologetics? I asked this question to several online groups that specialize in apologetics. I was surprised by how strongly negative many responses were. Here's one. I'm not going to disclose the identity of the individual. He's a remarkable man with incredible gifts of engagement. But this is what he wrote back straight away. Social media, it's a terrible place for any discourse beyond cat videos and pictures of your kids and for generally projecting a tableau of your life which makes it seem cooler and more together than it actually is. I mean, where do I start? It's a flat medium. You have no control of the mic, so the trolls have equal footing with the sane and the reasonable. I like social media for what it is. I detest it for how it's encouraged a shockingly mean-spirited and shallow public discourse. That's a pretty strong response by one of the leading communicators in North America today who speaks most days of the week on university campuses around the country. But he looks at online and just says, no thanks, too hard. This leads me to urge you, and with all seriousness, to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might and to put on the whole armour of God that you might stand. There is a spiritual discipline to engaging in apologetics and to engaging in apologetics online. We have to learn to walk by the Spirit, to prayerfully cultivate the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, fruitfulness, gentleness, self-control. 
these are the fruits that we have to cultivate and they have to become the hallmarks of our engagement online. And finally, this will take time. Apologetics on social media will look more zigzag than it will linear. It will proceed in slow increments rather than in all or nothing demands to change one's mind. If you want an image for apologetics in relation to social networking, don't think of the university debate stage. Okay? That's controlled. There's agreed upon rules. Trained people who'll get docked points or maybe risk losing by contravening the rules of discourse. The debate stage is not the model for online. Let me give you the model. Here's the image. Think of the orthodontist's office. Think of apologetics akin to the braces that the orthodontist applies to straighten teeth by way of gradual pressure over a long period of time. Using pliers to turn your teeth instantly may be possible. It's hardly desirable. It will cause pain and actually causes or offers no greater guarantee of straight teeth, right? Here's the point. Apologetics online will take time. It's not quick. It's not fast. It's not easy. That grates against the whole social media phenomena, which is so instant, which promises immediate gratification, information, satisfaction, likability, and so forth. So apologetics and social media threaten to be strangely mismatched unless we're deliberate about cultivating particular approaches. I'm going to stop there. Let me think about your stories, your questions, your examples. Uh, do you need a break or we just want to go through, Jeremy? What's good Anybody for you? Anybody needs to slip out, go ahead and do so quietly and we'll go right into Q&A. Good, good. Go ahead. Okay. So, I have a question about firebullying. Yes. So, would it be considered more of a personal problem? So, it should be avoided in like a lot of different ways, like blocking people or avoiding the conversation and just turning your phone off? And no. So, the question pertains to cyberbullying. Um, is, this, is this exclusively or more of a virtual problem, uh, given that there are ways to avoid it? Uh, I think... Mark, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Was that cyberbullying? Cyberbullying, yes, yeah, thank you, yeah. So the question is, you know, is cyberbullying a, a particular or a virtual problem, and can it be avoided by simple steps, like turning your phone off or so forth? I, I think we need to understand there are levels, right? Uh, so in some degree, you know, one of your friends makes an off-color comment or, or uh, attributes a position to you that you don't hold or posts a picture that's not flattering. Uh, that's one level, right? Um, and that may be addressed by talking to your friend, by blocking that person, that image. But generally when we talk about cyberbullying, and we're actually talking about a fairly developed um, sense of not just making life difficult or not just embarrassing you, but targeting you uh, for ridicule and for shaming. Um, so I think we need to say that, yeah, I can turn my phone off, but that doesn't mean the problem's gone away. That's part of the distress, right? Is that other people are seeing this or interacting with this or promulgating this. Um, so cyberbullying, you know, it, it, is, it is a virtual problem, but it has very real-world implications and circumstances. The stress that you feel, the shame that you feel, um, that's real. It's not just contained in that online world. So I think, again, we, we ought to have no part uh, in cyberbullying. We don't believe in coercion, embarrassment, shaming, that kind of thing as a way of doing apologetics. And... I would also say as Christians, when we see that happening, we need to be advocates for our friends. We need to actually, we need to push back where we have some voice to limit that. I saw our hand over here. Go ahead. Hi. So different platforms on Yeah. That's right. Yep. Yep. 
Yeah. Yeah. Like, how should we just not bother with certain platforms of social media that are very volatile? Yeah. Good question, yeah. So, you know, should we not bother with some platforms because of the way that they seem particularly prone to trolling uh, and to kind of volatility, hostility? You know, I'm reluctant. I'm probably not going to be able to utter the words, just give up, right? Um, I, I think it's kind of just not in my spirit to abandon uh, the platforms altogether. But I do think we have to be really wise and discerning, right? Platforms are not created for our Christian transmission of the gospel. We have to take seriously that the operating systems we're using were created by others for different purposes. Some of those purposes will approximate the transmission of information and viewpoints. Others uh, are not. It's like, you know, Instagram, you know, just here's your picture kind of thing and move on. Um, or or we, we have to say, I am more likely to be heard and well received by operating on a platform that actually promotes and desires the exchange of ideas and where there are agreed upon rules and policies. In other platforms, you know what, this is, I may be present and if I'm present, I can't not be a Christian, but this is probably not the place for developed answers. So take Twitter as a good example, 144 characters you can make a statement, you can ask a question, you can give a portion of a Bible verse, yeah. but it's a very limited media. Um, I don't think we should not be on it or not utilize it, but it's just not a great way uh, for discourse. There are other, uh, uh, NPR was talking yesterday uh, about a website called Change Your Mind. Uh, it's a platform that basically invites people who are feeling some inner turmoil about all kinds of questions to post their question with their rationale and they make an agreement to check back within three hours because people will push back and then the conversation disappears at the end of the day. And what they've discovered is that it's been, it's well ran, it's actively policed and everybody knows that by putting my point of view online, I'm actually asking for my mind to be changed. People will give other, that's a good thing. So I think, I think it was called, it's just called Change My Mind. It was owned, I can't remember which company owns it or runs it. It was a sub-message board group. But NPR had a great thing. By the way, they've discovered that it takes, generally takes three to four interactions for a person to change their mind. Less than that, they're not bought in. More than that, they tend to get bogged down. That might be something to explore for us as we think about how many times we repeat ourselves to our friends. Have we stopped doing apologetics and simply become annoying? Um, that's a real issue, right? But yes, we're going to have to take seriously different platforms serve different purposes. Therefore, we have to discern, am I using this platform well? Does it serve the purpose that I intend? Yeah. Give it up for Mark. Oh, you go.